Um, right, so we're going to move ahead with carbon capture and storage. And I'd like to ask, how many people feel they know enough about it? How many people actually would like to hear what it really is? In other words, is it something we talk too readily about but not really understand it? How many people feel comfortable with CCS? Okay. I'm not going to ask the, the other question then. Um, right, so Debbie, uh, you can see there's still a, a lack of knowledge at a critical time. Uh, Debbie um, uh, Ab Horef, who's Welsh, is the head of marketing for a company called Storega, which is moving very fast in this area. In fact, I met his boss, the chief executive, Nick Cooper, who can't be here today, um, at one of Prince Wales, the Prince of, the Prince of Wales' uh, SMI um, gatherings in Clarence House a couple of years ago. And I've been very impressed by the work that they've been doing. Carbon capture and storage, Debbie is going to explain in a moment, but has just had two very big licensing um, approvals made uh, in uh, around the United Kingdom, the Acorn Project and the Viking Project. The Acorn Project in Scotland and the Viking Project in Humberside. This is literally in the last month. So Debbie, in, in a minute, just underscore what CCS is. Thank you, Nick, uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, so carbon capture and storage is quite simply um, the capture of the CO2 from the emissions of an industrial process, whether it be power generation or steel making or cement. Uh, so cap chemically capturing the CO2, um, putting it in a pipeline, transporting it to a location where it is then injecting, injected deep into the subsurface of the earth, either into an, a depleted oil field, a depleted gas field, where the CO2 originated from, uh, ironically, um, or indeed a saline formation, which is uh, another reservoir or another geological formation that is suitable uh, for long-term um, uh, uh, storage of, of the CO2. Uh, for for forever. There are those who are concerned that it's storing up a sort of massive bomb of carbon dioxide or carbon uh, underground and we won't be able to control it. What is the science telling you now? What, 30 years into a lot of testing? Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, unfortunately, the CO2 is not, is not combustible. So um, fortunately, it won't create a bomb. Uh, but there is concern about, uh, quite rightly, in terms of if the storage reservoir isn't managed properly or isn't designed properly and engineered properly, CO2 could potentially leak. But let's, let's remember the, the, the storage reservoir is very deep, typically two to two and a half kilometers below the Earth's surface. Um, at least it needs to be at least one, one kilometer deep to maintain the CO2 in the liquid phase. Um, but these are very deep uh, structures, um, long way to the surface for, for escape into the atmosphere. Um, there are engineers monitoring this, uh, and, and the regulation, particularly in, across Europe, uh, the EU, EU CCS directive states that um, once a CO2 store is operating, and we assume a 20-year lifetime for a typical CO2 store, like the ones that we're developing and others are developing around the UK, Norway, and the North Sea, um, so 20 year of operations, the operator, the owner of the store, will be uh, responsible for maintaining and monitoring the CO2 to ensure that the CO2 is not escaping. And when we, do, when we talk about escape, we don't just mean escape vertically towards the atmosphere. We also mean escaping laterally, uh, uh, horizontally, throughout the, uh, beyond, in the geology beyond the boundary of the stated reservoir. Um, and, and the regulation states that the operator will be responsible for monitoring that and ensuring it doesn't escape for a further 20 years. So the operator of the store is, is responsible for that CO2 for a total of 40 years post the start of injection. So uh, there are regulations in place to safeguard the CO2 and engineering practices that are now confident and, uh, and well, well known to ensure it stays where it is. So Derry, what, what stage have you now got to with the approval of the uh, ACORN project in Scotland, Viking project in Humberside, and there's also a Norwegian project as well? What scientifically have you now proven which means that the licensing can go ahead in the way that has happened in the last six weeks so just to, just to be clear so Storega is responsible for and my colleagues uh, are responsible for the acorn project in scotland uh, other organizations uh, headed by harbor energy um, are responsible for the viking project in the in the humberside um, and then we're responsible also for the new license that we just obtained in norway called trudvang um, and the and the and the the developments we've received now are the the acorn from 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 the acorn perspective 
um, we are reusing existing oil and gas infrastructure. So the project will be reusing an existing pipeline, the GoldenEye pipeline, which, which has been uh, used in the past for transporting natural gas from the, uh, from the now depleted GoldenEye reservoir in the North Sea, uh, gas reservoir, onto, into the gas network at St. Fergus in Northern Scotland. Uh, we're gonna reuse that pipeline for CO2 transportation in the reverse flow direction from St. Fergus to the Acorn Reservoir, which is adjacent to the GoldenEye uh, depleted gas field. Um, so we, we now know that we understand how CO2 can be transported and stored. There are, I think, 4,000 kilometers in the North America that already transport CO2, albeit for the purposes of enhanced oil recovery, which is not our purpose. But the CO2 in a pipeline is well known now, and, and the science, uh, science and engineering is, is well versed. And likewise for storage, um, in Norway, uh, for, since 1996, one million tonnes per annum of CO2 has been injected into the subsurface in Sleipner. Uh, with Sleipner metric is off Western Norway. Indeed, and is literally, um, just by coincidence, really next door to our new licence called Trudbank on the Norwegian continental shelf. Now, help us understand the economics and the volume of this, because we're trying to reduce, all of us, carbon emissions. This at least is capturing the carbon, hopefully, and that's the guarantee that you have. What is the volume that you can capture which will fill this res these reservoirs? And how? what kind of impact will it therefore have on the overarching carbon total which we're trying to reduce? If I may, then, I do have one or two slides. So just a couple of statistics. Um, currently, the world is capturing and storing only about 40 million tonnes per annum uh, as of two 2021. That's Before, in the top right hand corner. Top here. right hand corner of the slide, indeed. Um, forecast expectations and milestones necessary to deliver net zero. By 2030, the global need for CCS is in the order of half a billion tonnes to one and a half billion tonnes. And likewise, by 2050 to deliver net zero, CCS needs to deliver or store and, and mitigate um, between two and a half billion and seven and a half billion tonnes of, of CO2 per annum. Now, just coincidentally, this week, the IEA has just published its roadmap to net zero. And similarly, in that report, um, the CCS chapter states that by 2030, they want to see a billion tonnes being stored globally, which is uh, nicely triangulated with this table. Uh, and likewise, for 2050, the uh, IEA roadmap suggests 6 billion tonnes of storage by, two, uh, by 2050. So again, well triangulated with this table. Now, how does that fit in terms of a bit more local, in terms of the UK, for example? Well, the UK uh, continental shelf, as we all know, a strong heritage, a long heritage of, uh, of hydrocarbon production, oil and gas. And those are the uh, prime targets for CO2 storage, as well as saline formations that we are using now in the future. Um, the UKCS has a total of, of about 78 billion tonnes of capacity, potential capacity, uh, which will be uh, converted into actual or practical capacity as projects be, uh, become developed. And that's across about 500 oil and gas, depleted oil and gas reservoirs and saline formations across the UK continental shelf alone. Put that in simple language. Does it actually how much of the carbon we're producing does it really capture? Is it just a, a thin layer at the top, or is it actually uh, capturing a substantive amount of what we're producing? So the UK government has a 10-point plan, um, and that's th still within the uh, Conservative Party manifesto. Uh, and in, within that 10-point plan, they want 10 million tonnes per annum being stored. 10 by million. 10 million tonnes. It's a little bit lower than the ambitions on the on the slide here but nonetheless it's a stated uh, um, target and and and, uh, and 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 incentive for the uk government 10 million tons per annum by 2030 is equivalent to 4 million motor cars being removed off the roads that still leaves a lot of cars a lot of cars but the but the four clusters that have now been announced so teesside Hynet, which is in Merseyside, and as you say, Viking in Humberside, and Acorn in Scotland, 
those four projects will likely by 2030 be, be storing approximately 40 million tons in aggregate across all four clusters. Um, and they will, that's, that's, that's 160 million vehicles. What about the economics of all of this? And please, if you'd like to ask a question, um, however, um, however basic, please um, put, your, put up your hand. We'll get a microphone to you immediately. One, one down here and one up there, please. Um, what about the economics of all of this? I've been involved with CCS for too many years, over 15 years. And up until recently, um, of, until the kind of phase four of the EU ETS, particularly in Europe, the, the, the primary focus of CCS was on power generation. So it was competing with renewables, it was competing with nuclear, um, and unfortunately it didn't kind of make much inroads. There was far more, far more success and, and, and far greater penetration by the renewable sector, and, and we congratulate that, and we should be grateful for that. Um, but more recently, the, the CCS um, policymakers has turned their attention to the difficult to abate sectors, particularly industry, such as cement, such as refineries, such as waste to energy, um, such as ethanol, such as natural gas processing and steel making. Um, so this slide here is a, what we call a carbon abatement curve. So it shows the size of the markets in Europe and within 50 kilometers of a port. So the CO2 could be transported to these offshore stores in Norway and in the UK. Um, so as you can see there, the, the more expensive sectors on the right hand side, power generation using natural gas or power generation using coal, they're still very expensive compared to where we expect to see the European carbon price or the EU ETS within the next five to 10 years, which is that shaded blue area in the region of about 80 euros to about 130, 150 euros a ton within the next five to 10 years. As you can see there, as you move towards the left, more and more sectors, industrial sectors, are becoming incentivized to invest in CCS because it's becoming lower cost to invest and implement and construct carbon capture facilities than it will be to actually emit freely the CO2 into the atmosphere because they, from 2028, for example, the waste to energy sector will have zero free allowances. In other words, they have to buy every single ton of CO2 they emit on the Euro European carbon market. And as we say, if this is going to reach 100 euros a ton or thereabouts, that is going to have a significant impact on their bottom line. So we're seeing a lot of inquiries now, a lot of uh, uh, requests and, and change and uptake and growth in the CCS world, particularly from the emitters across those sectors, because they can see that the, the cost of emitting is not sustainable. They have to do something about their emissions. Electrification in most of these sectors is not possible in the time frame between now and 2030 or even 2050. So CCS is the only solution for these, unfortunately. Um, so as you can see, it's becoming more and more economic over the over for the next five to ten, over the next short term period, far more economic than it has been in the past. And one of the great uh, paradoxes in all of this is the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States. What impact has that had? Uh, to change the market in the way it's changing so many markets at the moment? That's a very good question. And I think it's really interesting to understand, uh, to, to reflect. And, and we as the regular are, are very much looking, and we're active in the US, by the way, and not just in Northwest Europe, but we're also supporting various projects in North America, solely because of the Infl Inflation Reduction Act and the 45Q. And just for, for your benefit, the 45Q is basically a, 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 a tax incentive uh, for CO2 storage, um, sequestration, uh, the capture or the storer will receive 85 US dollars per ton of CO2 stored. So unlike Europe, where there's a market, uh, the EU ETS, which provides a, a fluctuating price and can go low, it can go high, um, but that provides a bit of an incentive for capture on, or industry to capture their emissions. Likewise, now in, the, in North America, there is an incentive, which is the $85 a ton. Now, of course, that's a little bit different in its structure because it's a fixed price today. It's not a fluctuating market. So it does it does kind of, I guess, limit today in the short term which emitters and which businesses and which industries are incentivized to invest in CCS. And as this chart can be usefully uh, used to, to, to prove the point, on the left-hand side there, you can see the ethanol, which is very prevalent in North America, fertilizer, hydrogen, refineries, 
all those all those industry industrial sectors are economic at eighty five dollars a ton. So in answer to your question, mm. Nick, a lot of those sectors, a lot of those emitters now are coming forward with a desire to invest in CCS, and and as a consequence, more and more of the hydrocarbon developers and small independents such as the Rega are now developing stores to service that CO2. So the IRA has really become a booster for you, for your operation. So right, let's get a couple of questions at the back. Got the microphone. Thank you. Um, so carbon capture has often been described to me, at least, as a last resort rather than a first line of defence. So my question is, what makes your product more effective than, say, planting trees or cultivating ocean algae? Park that, Debbie, for the moment, please. Question here. Yeah, and that was also one of my questions, but I will uh, use my other question that I had in store as well. Um, so basically, you were talking before about pumping the carbon back to the reserves of oil. And um, what is to prevent that from being omitted again, or emitted again when you then burn said oil? So basically, if you increase the carbon levels of the oil in the reserves, how will that not like impact us in the long term, basically? Trees, trees. Um, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't suggest that carbon capture is a silver bullet. Carbon capture and storage is one of the several mitigating technologies that are available today to deliver net zero by twenty fifty. Energy transition is exactly that; it's a transition. So we believe in Storega that. To, trans to, trans to transit through from a high carbon today to a lower carbon tomorrow and a zero carbon future, we need to utilize or need to use or consume hydrocarbons in any way that they are currently being used but in a much more sustainable and a lower carbon way. So CCS allows that and enables that, that transition to take place. Um, once nuclear fusion is around, then we'll all be out of a job anyway and, and we can all go home happy. Um, but you know, it's not a silver bullet. So in terms of where does it sit alongside reforestation, it's one of the mitigating factors. So it's, it's part of the mix. It's part of the mix. It's an and relationship, not an or. So okay. we don't want politicians to make the choice. They need to deploy all of them. And that question there? The question there was, you're primarily thinking about enhanced oil recovery. Strega and in Europe are not supporting enhanced oil recovery. There are no uh, political mechanisms and, and policy support regulations for enhanced oil recovery in Europe. US has been happening for the last 40 to 50 years, and the technology is well known. But in Europe, and particularly the Rega projects, we will have no involvement with hydrocarbon production. Enhanced gas recovery, enhanced oil recovery will not take place. We are simply using the reservoirs because the geology is known and the data is available. All right, we've got a couple of minutes. Please, let me get more questions in here, and then the microphone will come across. Hi, uh, Chris Stratton from the ENA. Um... I noticed that on your uh, chart above that the hydrogen bar is quite small at the moment, but I, I imagine that that will increase in future with more demand for hydrogen from from industry and possibly to be used in 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 heating as a solution. Where do you stand on sort of blue hydrogen and how much is is being invested in that? Obviously, because obviously green hydrogen is the best option because. Um, that's all from renewables, um, but I don't know whether that would produce enough in terms of quantity. Is that an hydrogen. issue for CCS or not? It's not an issue for CCS. I believe the hydrogen uh, debate is not, again, it's not an all re relationship between green hydrogen or blue hydrogen. It's a basic case of it's blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. The technology needs to be scaled up for green hydrogen. Um, so that I get, again, wanted, not, not wanted to be too much of a marketing person, but my job title is in marketing. Um, Storega is involved in both blue hydrogen and green hydrogen, and you're quite right. I think the transition to net zero by 2030 will primarily involve blue hydrogen, while the green hydrogen technology matures and, and increases in scale. So beyond 2030, 2035, there will probably be a replacement of blue hydrogen with green hydrogen. Thank you, please. Hi, uh, Marlin from Hattrick. Um, so I want, I want to ask you... Um, this type of technology, does it not just hold us where we already are, as in it doesn't drive change in in any way? So, and you know, how what, what are you seeing from the people or the businesses that you're working with? Um, are they changing or does it just allow them to, you know, stick with the way that would, things are done currently, basically? In other words, like putting our rubbish in the rubbish bin, yeah. someone else deals with it, takes it off to a, a site or burns it or whatever. In other words, it's offloading our responsibility or not. 
again, as, I, as, I, as, as the previous question and my previous answer, CCS is not a silver bullet. We're looking to continue with operations. You know, we can't get to a net zero in a, in a, in a big bang situation. We will need to transition there. Um, CCS allows us to do that and use hydrocarbons in a much cleaner way. Um, and, and, and I think, yeah, that, that's, that's primarily our, our, our responsibility to make sure that as we transition, we do it as, as low carbon as possible. One bit of advice, don't talk about a big bang. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I think we all understand the need for CCF, especially in heavy industry, in the transition. It is what you say in the label. What worries me, and I, perhaps I misunderstood you, is that I think that the biggest emitters are still energy source and is oil. So oil production on methane leakage and CO2 leakage, which is absolutely possible to capture with technology like yours. What is your view on that and how do we accelerate because we will still need oil for petrochemical and other kind of things. However, how do we do it more sustainable by capturing those, you know, ethanol, methanols and CO2s, right. which is by the way voluntary. Yeah, we were almost out of time, but there's another question here. Hi there, I'm Doreen. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Um, could you talk through about the costs of developing the carbon capture technology? in addition to the storage, because we've just seen Rosebank approved yesterday without any form of CCUS. Um, so Rosebank yesterday, clearly a controversial decision um, in the news. And um, you know we're not involved. Equinor are the, are the operator of that project with Ithaca. Um, again, it's part of the transition. And I, and I, and I understand it's the, it's the UK government's uh, decision in terms of addressing cost of cost of living uh, and, and securing energy security um, with the with the unfortunate circumstances of the last 12 18 months um, so I need to you know the UK needs to ensure and it's and it maintain its its very proud kind of history of ensuring energy security um, and I think this is another next step but let's let's remember as well Equinor who are developing this project um, they are one of the primary drivers of CCS across Europe they had one of the originals at Schleipner, which Schleipner. you mentioned earlier. And indeed, it's been going what twenty five years. Twenty five years, yeah. And indeed, they were also a, a joint operator and developer of the um, uh, of the project in Algeria, which was more of an experimental pilot, but albeit with with Equinor, who was Statoil at the time, uh, and BP and Sonatra. So Equinor have been, you know, almost founding fathers of CCS in this part of the world. Yeah. All right, we're going to have to run. Uh, we're going to have to stop, leave your question, I'm afraid. I'm being told we've got to wrap up. So thank you very much, Dewey. Thank you. Um, I hope more of you understand what carbon capture is about and where it's going and the opportunities and the fact that licensing is now being introduced, which wasn't taken for granted, I have to yeah. say, four or five years ago. Indeed. Thank you very much, Dewey. Let me introduce you to Hannah again.